Welcome to this presentation of the ESA 2020 paper, Space Efficient, Fast and Exact Routing in Time-Dependent Road Networks. My name is Tim Zeitz, I'm a PhD student at KIT Karlsruhe, and this project has been joint work with Ben Strasser and Dorothea Wagner. In the next couple of minutes, I'm going to give you a hopefully brief and high-level introduction to the core ideas behind our paper. If you want any more details, of course, uh, I would be happy to answer your questions during the live sessions, and you are also very, very welcome to take a look into our paper, of course. All right, so let's get right started. Um, the scenario that our paper is aiming for is the one of online routing services, where uh, there's a map application somewhere in the internet, and users can ask for good routes through a road network from some point A to some point B, and the server should answer those queries. And we have a couple of requirements for our service. That is, we want them, well, we want the algorithms that we execute on the server to be space efficient. So use as little memory as possible, because hardware is expensive. And also, we want to be able to answer queries fast, because CPU time is expensive, and fast queries enable certain interactive applications. And finally, we want the algorithms to always, uh, always find the exact shortest paths so that users always get good routes, at least good routes if the data is good, and that no heuristic can go off the rails and deliver weird results or so. So that is the space efficient, fast, and exact that we want to achieve. Also, we assume that the road network will rarely change. So, um, many queries will be answered on the same network. And so the server is allowed to do some pre-processing to be able to answer, query more, uh, to answer queries faster. And of course, to achieve exactness, we first need to formalize our problem so that we can say what, exact, what exactly exact would mean. And um, if we want to model a road network, such as the one you see in the example here, we can do that as a graph where intersections become nodes and road segments between the intersections become arcs. And then with each arc, there is an associated weight, which in our case is the travel time, but it could also be something else like fuel consumption or distance. And then finding a good route becomes the classical um, problem of finding the shortest path between two nodes in a graph. However, in our case, uh, we have a slightly ex expanded problem setting. Um, in our case, the travel times at the road segments are not scalar numbers, but they are uh, travel time functions, uh, which depend on the time of the day. So during the night, traversing a road segment might be fast. And then during the morning, and especially during the rush hour, it gets slower and slower, and then becomes a little faster again during midday. And then in the evening, there's this huge evening rush hour peak where everything is very slow until it gets faster during the night again. Um, in our case, those functions are assumed to be piecewise linear and periodic. And usually they cover one day, but of course your data could look different. Um, that depends on the application. And uh, users during query time need also to specify a departure time because now um, the route, of course, the fastest route might change during the day. Now this is still a very classical problem and it can be solved with a very classical algorithm, the, c the algorithm of Dijkstra, which finds shortest paths by starting with the, the start node and then exploring the nodes of the graph with, ex uh, with increasing distance. So there is this growing ball around the start node. Um, and once Dijkstra's algorithm finds the target node, it knows the final distance. Um, this algorithm has been around for a long time. It's very simple to implement. It is guaranteed to always find the exact shortest path. And also it's quite flexible. It can be used for the time-dependent setting basically without any adjustments. However, it has one big problem, and that is it is rather slow. Uh, Dijkstra's algorithm will 
inherently explore all nodes that are closer to the origin than the target node is. And in case of long-range queries in modern road networks, which may have millions of nodes and edges, that is too slow. That leads to running times of several seconds, which is way too slow for interactive applications. But since this is a very practical problem, a lot of research has been done in the past 15 years. And as it turns out, um, road networks have certain inherent structures that we can exploit to speed up Dijkstra's algorithm. And one property that is very common, commonly used is the hierarchy in road networks, because some nodes in road networks are more important than others. And we can exploit that with a very simple theoretical concept, that is the concept of graph overlays. Uh, what is an overlay? An overlay graph is just a graph with uh, a subset of the nodes, and you should think of these subset nodes as being more important than the other ones. And then this overlay graph also has some edges, some original ex edges, some extra edges. Um, and the only property that, that we demand is that the distances between the nodes in the overlay remains exactly the same as in the original graph. And what uh, that is useful because whenever we want to know a shortest distance between two nodes in the overlay graph, we can skip all the unimportant nodes. We don't need to look at them, and Dijkstra needs only to explore the nodes in the overlay. And this becomes even more useful when we start considering uh, multi-level overlays, that is, overlays on top of overlays with even more important nodes and even more important nodes. And if we take this idea to the very extreme, where we have one overlay graph for each individual node, basically, then we end up with a very effective and quite popular and successful speed-up technique for routing in road networks, that is contraction hierarchies. Contraction hierarchies during pre-processing time need to build up those overlay graphs. But since there's an overlay basically for each node, um, we can do that very easily by iteratively removing nodes and just preserving the distances among the rest of the nodes. And since only one node is removed, it is enough to consider the local neighborhood. Um, so the preprocessing of contraction hierarchies, at least given already an ordering of the node nodes, which gives us the importance, which is a step I'm going to skip over here, um, we can iteratively remove a single node and insert additional shortcut arcs, which represent the distance of the path over the node. So for example, here's an arc with length five, which represents first going here, one to x, and then four up here again. So we get an arc of length five. Uh, and then we do a little bit of cleanup, we move multiple arcs, and some shortcuts may not necessary because there are other shortest paths to the rest of the graph. Uh, but once we do this step, which is called node contraction, for every node, um, we get an augmented graph, which is very useful because we can do a very effective query algorithm. And that is do a bidirectional Dijkstra search, starting from both the start node and the end node. And both searches only search to higher rank nodes. And because of this overlay property and the way that we constructed the graph, there will be always a shortest path which looks like that. First only going up, which the forward search will find, and then going only down, which the backward search will find. And this query algorithm yields speedups over Dijkstra uh, by four orders of magnitude. So it's very effective and is employed quite successfully in practice. So it would be nice if we could apply this contraction hierarchy technique to time-dependent road networks. And in fact, that has already been done. There has been extensive previous research. Um, and here in this talk, I'm going to compare primarily to the works of Gernot Veit Batz, who did his dissertation on the subject and extended contraction hierarchies to the time-dependent setting. Now, conceptually, it's actually not that complicated. All we need to do is handle those functions, right? Which is conceptually not too complicated. 
during pre-processing. Now, instead of summing up two weights, we need to chain two, two such functions, and that is called linking. And then we get a new function at the shortcut, but it's still a piecewise linear function. Uh, and we can continue computing with that. And then we need to merge two such functions, that is, find the minimum of two such functions, which is still a piecewise linear function, so it's possible. It's called merging. And for the query, we also need to do some modifications. The backward search doesn't work as easily anymore because we don't know the arrival time at the target node, so we can't just do a Dijkstra search from there. Um, but that's all challenges that can be worked around. And actually, this time-dependent uh, time time -dependent contraction hierarchies do work rather well. They achieve fast queries and they achieve exactness. However, they have one big problem, one big problem uh, beside that they are quite complicated to implement because linking and merging are only easy in theory. Implementing them is quite hard. The main problem is that linking two such travel time functions together um, generates a new travel time function, uh, travel time function which has as many breakpoints as the two input functions combined. And since shortcuts in contraction hierarchies on high levels might go over paths of lengths of thousands of arcs, we suddenly end up with travel time functions with tens of thousands of breakpoints. And this actually becomes a problem with the memory consumption. It actually becomes prohibitive on continental-sized instances such that you need several hundreds of gigabytes to perform queries when you do it like that. So for our research, we set out with, with a question, and that is, do we really need to store travel time functions at shortcuts, or can we do something else? And that is the idea I'm presenting in this talk, and that is what we explored in our paper. And we ended up with a technique that we call catch-up, customizable approximated time-dependent contraction hierarchies through unpacking, which is quite a mouthful. Um, but I hope to give you the high-level ideas now. So our idea is based on an intuition, and that is I hope you can, you can relate to that idea from your practical experience if you go by car. Usually, even if there's heavy commuter congestion on your way to work or back from work, you will probably still take the same path, right? Normally, the highway remains the best option even during the rush hour. And even though the time it takes to, to drive that route might change quite a bit, the best route rarely changes. And we were thinking if we could apply that practical observation uh, and use that to find a different shortcut representation. So our idea is rather than storing those complex functions with many breakpoints, maybe we can just store those points in time where the best path changes. And so our idea was, okay, if we have a shortcut, rather than storing this travel time function, we want to store a table which tells us at which point in time the shortcut expands to which of these lower triangles, because shortcuts in contraction hierarchies always skip over exactly one node. However, those could also be shortcuts, and then we get the longer paths. And then we tried implementing that idea and performed lots of engineering work and evaluated how far we could take that idea. Um, we combined that shortcut representation not with sh standard contraction hierarchies, but with a special variant called customizable contraction hierarchies. In customizable contraction hierarchies, the preprocessing is split in three phases. First, the ordering, where the importance of each node is determined, and that is done using a nested dissection order. So we recursively find small separators in our graphs, um, and the separator become the separated nodes become the most important nodes. And then we recurse on both sides and again find a small separator and this second level uh, separator will become the next most important nodes. Uh, and the same on that side and recursively so on. So that gives us the ordering. Once we have the ordering, 
customizable contraction hierarchies actually do a, a, a contraction without any uh, without any weights. So we just insert all possible shortcuts. So we get always a click between the neighbors of the node, which boils down to caudal completion. And these two phases, we don't need to do any adjustments because they don't use the weights at all, or in our case, the travel time functions. Um, only the third phase of the preprocessing, the so-called customization, needs to deal with travel time functions and weights. Uh, in customizable contraction hierarchies, this third phase computes the weights for all edges um, by doing a bottom-up sweep over all arcs uv and enumerating all possible lower triangles and then just computing the sum of the weights down here and seeing which one has the smallest weight and that is then the weight of the shortcut. So in our case, for the catch-up customization, we need to do the same, but we need to compute those tables for each arc. The basic scheme remains the same, but to get practical performance, we need to do a bunch of optimizations to, to make that whole thing practical. Um, the first thing that we note is to compute those tables, we actually do need travel time functions, because otherwise we couldn't compute those exact points in time where the best path changes. But we can throw away those profiles once we no longer need them. So once all outgoing arcs of U going to higher rank nodes have been processed, we know that we won't need any more of the profiles at, function, uh, at arcs going downward to lower rank nodes, and we can throw away the fun uh, those profiles. Also, we can employ the same parallelization strategies as we can for classical customizable contraction hierarchies. And then also, what has proven quite effective is to do a lot of pruning and avoid expensive link and merge operations. Uh, and we do that in two ways. First, we do a pre-customization where we only use scalar upper and lower bounds at each arc, which already allow us to uh, remove a bunch of arcs or uh, see that we won't need to link certain profiles. And also, we process triangle in a certain, f uh, in a certain order. We first process triangles where according to the bounds, the triangle is shorter. So then we can possibly avoid linking the functions uh, of longer triangles later because we can see by the bounds that we will never need that. Uh, and all of that is still not enough. We need a, a final piece to make the whole thing run in acceptable time and that is employ approximation Rather than storing the exact travel time profiles, we use approximated upper and lower bound functions, which have less interpolation points. Uh, and then we merge these, these envelope functions and see during which times actual uh, intersections could actually occur and only unpack these exact profiles on demand to find the exact merge points and obtain these tables. So that are our adjustments for the customization. Uh, for the query, we need also to do a bunch of things to achieve good performance, because if we do a naive query and just start our bidirectional Dijkstra um, and completely unpack shortcuts on demand to evaluate the travel time of a shortcut, uh, the query becomes rather slow because those unpacked shortcuts may have long paths and also sometimes paths may overlap. Um, rather, we do two things to do uh, less unpacking. First is we first do a corridor search using um, upper and lower bounds at each shortcuts, which already uh, significantly, significantly shrinks down the search space. Uh, and then we do the shortcut unpacking only lazily. On this, uh, on this corridor, we perform Dijkstra's algorithm, and whenever we encounter a shortcut, we unpack it, uh, but only the first part until we reach an original edge uh, that we can relax and the rest is not unpacked, but only added to the search space. 
So in that case, both those arcs are original arcs, so um, we don't need to do any additional unpacking. But here, we first unpack this until we reach an original arc, and the rest is only added to the search space. And then Dijkstra proceeds, and only when we get here, we unpack that shortcut. Finally, we can also use the lower bounds from the corridor search uh, to do an A star search instead of a Dijkstra search, and with that we get quite good running times. So let's take a look at what our implementation achieves compared to other techniques. Um, we have here um, our algorithm catch up, two competitors, uh, KATCH, which is an open source implementation of time-dependent contraction hierarchy, and then a s uh, simple heuristic time-dependent sampling, which is not exact, but rather eff effective. And the graph is um, an instance provided by PTV uh, Germany from 2017 um, with 7.2 million nodes, 16 million arcs, and roughly 30% of the arcs do have time-dependent profiles with 30 interpolation points in the beginning. Representing this graph in memory takes about 700 megabytes. Um, and we can already see that our technique only needs twice as much data um, or generates twice as much data during preprocessing. Uh, even the heuristic already needs five gigabytes and KATCH needs a whopping 42 gigabytes of space. However, KATCH achieves um, the fastest queries with 1.38 milliseconds only. However, catch up is not that much behind with 1.87 milliseconds, which is still a significant speed up over the baseline Dijkstra with uh, 817 milliseconds. Also, catch up is when enabling full parallelization uh, with only two minutes of preprocessing time, uh, the algorithm with the fastest preprocessing. Now, looking at an even bigger instance, um, a network from 2017 of Europe with 26 million nodes and 55 million arcs, we suddenly um, see the problem of time dependent contraction hierarchies when storing travel time profiles at shortcuts. Um, first off, KATCH requires a lot of time for the preprocessing, so that is 50 minutes roughly. And while the preprocessing still finishes, it outputs 150 gigabytes of extra data. And on our testing machine, which had 192 gigabytes of RAM, that was not enough to execute any queries. The uh, implementation crashed uh, because it tried to allocate more memory than was available. Ketchup, on the other hand, only needs 5.5 gigabytes of data, which is, again, roughly twice as much as the input graph and achieves still query with queries with running times of 4.5 milliseconds, which is uh, qui quite good and um, definitely enough for interactive applications. The heuristic is still a little bit faster, however, of course, not exact. Uh, and in terms of pre-processing time, catch-up is still the fastest algorithm with only 11 minutes. Um, we also did a comparison to other related work algorithms that you can find in the paper on an older graph. Now, to finally convince you of the effectiveness of our shortcut scheme, uh, I want to show you a few numbers on how many different triangles or expansions, we call it, uh, they are stored for each shortcut uh, at this Europe 17 instance. And on average, it's only 1.1. And we can see that nine, uh, 89, 98.4% of the edges have exactly one triangle to which they always expand during the entire day. And the maximum of different expansions per shortcut is 115 uh, in this entire instance, even for very long shortcuts. That is still two orders of magnitude less, uh, two orders of magnitudes less than the tens of thousands of breakpoints that we get 
in time-dependent contraction hierarchies. So our unpacking scheme, our shortcut storing scheme, proves to be quite effective. And with that, I'd like to conclude. I showed you a catch-up, a new speed-up technique for routing in time-dependent road networks, uh, which on one hand uses overlay graphs to exploit hierarchical structures in road networks, and then on the other hand, exploits the fact that in time-dependent road networks, the travel time might change, but the paths change much less frequently. And we use that to achieve space efficiency and use up to 30 times less memory than other uh, competi competing algorithms while still achieving competitive query times. And our algorithm is exact. And to the best of our knowledge, our algorithm is the first one to achieve those three objectives at the same time. So um, the conclusion probably is to store paths at shortcuts rather than travel times in time-dependent road networks, and that that's a worthwhile research, research direction for speed-up techniques in time-dependent road networks. Uh, and that's all I have so far. I'm looking forward to your questions in the live session, and thank you for listening to this presentation. <laughs>